Okay. So, uh, kinetic analysis in drug discovery and development. So, I think just start off with a slide that highlights really the uh, overall process of drug development. Um, this is particularly challenging. So, this is a process that actually takes about 10 years. And that's if you're lucky and you get it right. So, what this involves is initial identification of the disease you're going to go after, targets that may be relevant in that disease, that altered, and that you have, if you have a drug interacting with them, is going to somehow modify that disease. Once you've got that, you're looking at uh, identifying things in, in preclinical models, taking it then into humans for initial phase, phase one, safety, small number of subjects. Phase two, you're starting to look for, for efficacy, continuing to build up your safety database. And if you're seeing signals of efficacy, then you're going to go to a phase three, which is your, your large 2000 uh, subject patient trial that is going to demonstrate uh, significant uh, efficacy on some clinical endpoint that you hope is going to be uh, enough for uh, regulatory bodies to approve this. So that... I mean, it's when you initially discover a compound, you file a patent, you've got about 17 years to sort of, you know, make value for the uh, company that's expended all this money on developing these things. It takes you about 10 years to get one of these drugs approved if you're lucky. So you only have about seven years to make any, any money out of it. And you can see from the, the middle band here, the sort of attrition that's involved. So you know, actually, it's only about 5% of compounds that pass this in early stage, 2% the next stage, 20% that get through the clinical phases. And the costs to do this these days are, are vast. So this it's about currently is about a, a billion dollars for every successful medicine that you get to market. So you want to be making some smart decisions as you go along. I think that's the, the most important thing to say. And imaging plays a, a very valuable role in decision making. Uh, at a number of different points along this uh, discovery and development trajectory. So biomarker development, this is an area where, you know, we need, to, by creating uh, imaging uh, markers that are able to uh, provide readouts that are relevant for the disease we're looking at, that's important if we want to do target engagement studies, if we want to look at um, often stratifying subjects or measuring changes in, in PD endpoints, we need appropriate and relevant biomarkers. Uh, we can also just label the drugs themselves and look at tissue exposure or biodistribution. All of these things can help decision making at different points along the discovery and development pipeline. But really the point to emphasize is, is that the value here is timing. So it's really not much use to sort of show why something didn't work later on. You ideally want to be, because your costs are building as you progress to large clinical phase threes, you want to be able to kill drugs that aren't going to work as early as possible and progress with confidence ones that have the right characteristics. So timing of imaging is, is really important. And what we're going to talk about today is really to look at some of these different uh, ways in which imaging can impact on on, on drug development and, and see how kinetics, uh, kinetic analysis plays a role in kind of different ways in, in these uh, different areas. So we're gonna start off by looking at uh, biomarker development. This is something that normally comes early. So you obviously wanna have these tools available when you're uh, progressing candidate molecules into preclinical evaluation and subsequently into human. So what makes a good uh, radio tracer or radio ligand for measuring a protein target in, in drug development? So there's, there's a number of key characteristics when we're looking at CNS drug development as we are here. And one of them is that obviously to have a, a good brain imaging agent, it needs to get across the blood brain barrier. So it has to be BBB penetrant. And that means that either it's a small molecule that diffuses across or there's some transporter that allows it to get in. We know that uh, molecules will also bind to 
things that we're not necessarily interested in. So fat, lipid, things like that, which gives us a background signal, often called non-specific binding. So we want to minimize that because that kind of just masks out the specific signal, which is ultimately what we're interested in. So this is the thing that's binding to the protein target of interest that we're designing our compound to bind to. Um, but you can have things that are, have such high affinity for this target that they are very irreversible and actually end up only providing you really good images of blood flow. So kinetics are important too. So I, the ideal situation is we have something that what we would say is reversible kinetics. It binds sufficiently high affinity to the target that we're able to, to measure that target. Um, uh, Non-specific binding is low enough such that we're able to see it. So all of those good things relate to actually understanding the kinetic profile of candidate molecules. So this just goes back to some work that we did uh, 2009. This was work with Chi Guo, and this was looking at actually can we can we help um, do in silico analyses to predict whether something is going to provide a a good uh, imaging agent or not. I help the chemists in terms of identifying the right compounds, and particularly working with uh, large pharmaceutical companies that often have access to really quite vast compound libraries and uh, characteristics of those compounds contained within them, we were able to develop biomathematical modeling tools that effectively simulates what would be the case with a particular compound in vivo without having to radio label the molecule and assessing whether it was going to provide a good signal or not. And so the way we do this is we look at ultimately the identifiability of what we call the binding potential. This is the uh, outcome measure of interest in these types of experiment <clears throat> and is proportional to the Bmax over the KD. And the Bmax is the, the concentration of the protein target that we're interested in. This you can think of by, if you were doing kinetic analysis in terms of trying to estimate <clears throat> binding potential, we would calculate the, the volume of distribution in the target region subtract off the reference region and divide by your reference region, that would give you the binding potential. And you can see in this particular diagram, here's eight compounds. Uh, we can see the background signal, this uh, VND displayed in blue, and the specific signal which sits on top of that displayed in green. So the total is the, is the green plus the blue. That's what we're measuring in our target region. If we have a, a background region devoid of the target, we measure the blue. And that allows us to get to our binding potential. So which of these compounds do you think provides the best signal? So that's the question that's being posed here. So have a think about that for a minute. And then <clears throat> you'll realize that I was asking an unfair question because I didn't give you all the information you needed. And that is you also need to understand what is the variability associated with estimating both the total volume of distribution and the uh, the background, the VND. And there's factors that come into this. There's you know, how well it's delivered to the brain, the, the kinetics and all of that information which comes into it. So, But if you do know that information, then you can actually work out which of these has the strongest signal and you can characterize that in terms of your percentage coefficient of, of your binding potential. And coefficient of variation of your of your binding potential, which is if you were to do lots of realizations, you can think of that as the uh, the SD over the mean. So small error associated with the signal, high confidence in what is uh, the binding potential value. And the way we we did this in practice was using a kinetic model, which is akin to the simplified reference tissue model. In fact, it is it is the simplified reference tissue model. And what that does is use a single tissue compartment model in both your target and your reference region. And in your reference region, you just have delivery, K1, and efflux, K2. You have some free and non-specific component in there. And the only difference in the target is that in addition to uh, delivery and efflux, the efflux is modified by the binding potential. So the more uh, target protein you have, the higher the binding potential, 
then the, the larger the volume of distribution in that compartment. And so this model has three parameters. So it's quite parsimonious. Um, what we're trying to do here is quite difficult. So we don't want to over parameterize the model and get carried away in terms of thinking we can do things we can't. Um, we need to know what K1, K2 and binding potential is in order to be able to simulate target tissue kinetics and reference tissue kinetics. And to do that, we're able to break them down into sort of uh, micro parameter formulations. So K1 is flow times extraction. So if we know blood flow, we know the permeability surface area product, uh, then we can predict K1. If we know aqueous volumes and uh, tissue free fractions, which we can measure using equilibrium analysis and, and the K1 from above, then we can predict K2. And again, binding potential can be predicted from Bmax over KD. So if we do all that, uh, this just shows some examples with some real world data. This highlights a number of different compounds. So we have flumazenol, raclopride, FLB457, PK1195, and uh, another <coughs> GSK compound here. So just starting at the bottom, coefficient of variation here is greater than 100%. This is a compound which really doesn't get into the brain in any significant way. So it's not going to be a good ligand. And that's highlighted by this, this poor coefficient of variation. Uh, if we look in at PK, so this is one of the first generation TSPO tracers, not particularly good, suffers from high and non-specific grinding uh, and the likes, and you can see that, and that's <clears throat> manifested by, you know, a reasonably high uh, coefficient of variation. Now, if we start to look at some of these, these are all D2 agents at the top here, so we've got, well, Braclopride and FLBR, and then we've got Fumazinol. If you if you sort of talk to <clears throat> modelers, uh, well, they'll tell you that Fumazin and Raclopride have the nicest characteristics for modeling. And it doesn't even sort of come down to using any of these particular models. It's, it's sort of, but it's playing to these same factors. So they have a good K1, they get into the brain well, good statistics. They have what's a sensible binding potential. You want something that's big, but not too big. So something around a binding potential of three to four from a sort of empirical point of view tends to be something that provides the best signal. And glumazin and raclopide do have those. So those come out actually of all the compounds that were assessed. I think in the paper we looked at something like 30 compounds. These had the lowest coefficients of variation. So that was reassuring that they matched expert opinions. Here, if you go to FLB457, what you see is that um, whilst this doesn't work in the straight and particularly well, because actually this is a much higher affinity D2 ligand. What it means there is that actually in the in striatal regions is that now the kinetics start to go irreversible and become flow limited so you can't really estimate the binding potential particularly well but what you can do is now start to see that it works well for uh, extra striatal areas where you've got a much lower density of d2 where you get a, a coefficient variation of, of, of two percent so one way you can use kinetic analysis is in this area is to help with the uh, discovery and development uh, of novel radial ligands. If we moving on to looking at uh, drug delivery and tissue exposure. So in this regard, we're talking about biodistribution experiments. And really at the moment, probably two main ways that uh, companies are trying to deliver uh, drugs to the brain. So. I mean, well, this oral is the most common. I mean, there's also intravenous injections and things like that. But, uh, you know, oral is the most simple, can be sold over the counter and, and is the ideal uh, situation, particularly for small molecules, which can cross into the blood-brain barrier via the systemic uh, circulation. So that's, that's often the desired route for small molecules. For large molecules, these do not cross the blood-brain barrier uh, in the in the normal way is because they're much bigger and there's there's a real desire in terms of getting specialist sort of you know antibodies or asos or other large molecules into the brain because they have a lot of uh, hope for you know particularly neurodegenerative diseases so one way to approach that is to use uh, intrathecal administration and that circumvents the normal uh, entry across the blood-brain barrier through uh, 
uh, Norway and gets in via the CSF. And so both of these are relevant in terms of the types of experiments one might do to see great information for no-go, go-no-go decisions is if you're developing a drug that needs to get into the brain, then being able to directly measure or not whether it does seems like a pretty good thing to do to give yourself confidence. And we can, we can do more than just actually uh, test whether a, uh, a drug gets in, but we can start to provide information on actual concentration in the brain and also whether there's any uh, transport liabilities. So I'll come on to the transport liabilities in a minute, but first of all, just come down to this equation in, in the middle here, which says that the free concentration in the tissue, so in this case, that's the brain, can is actually determined as our tissue free fraction, um, which we'll talk about in a second, multiplied by our VND. So this is the partition coefficient in a region we're not talking about imaging agents that bind to specific targets. So we're just talking about free and non-specific binding. And we can derive that from kinetic analysis. If we've labeled that particular drug, injected it, measured an input function, done all the kinetic analysis, we can estimate that, uh, that parameter. And then we can uh, multiply that by the plasma concentration of the drug. Just to um, explain what the free fraction is here, this is converting our VND into the free concentration of the drug, because this tells us in, in the tissue what fraction of that tissue signal is equal to free drug. And you can measure that using a technique called equilibrium analysis. So this uses unlabeled compounds. This is <clears throat> uh, HPLC type mass spec measurements that's done using a chamber that has a semi-permeable membrane. And on one side of it, <clears throat> you have some tissue and the other you have a buffer solution, you can add your cold drug and you can measure these things. Let them, <clears throat> first of all, letting them equilibrate and then measuring what fraction is, is free. So where does, again, just to emphasize free concentration of the brain is the free fraction multiplied by the VND, which comes from kinetic analysis times the plasma concentration of the drug. Now, if you've got the free concentration in, in the brain, you can also get an estimate of what your target engagement might be if you assume knowledge of your, of your KD. Um, so that's also something to think about in terms of providing more information and understanding whether you will. We'll see later that the, <clears throat> the best way to do these things is to directly measure target engagement, but just worth noting. So this is some data uh, that explored this. This took, the, I think it was 36 compounds where fully dynamic kinetic data were obtained with a, a, an arterial input function and metabolites. So those were corrected and all of those compounds were analyzed for their, for their VND uh, using either one, two tissue compartment models, whatever was the most appropriate uh, I think we used a Kaiki information criteria to select between the different models and identify the VND. Now, we can break down VND into this nice equation here, which is the product of the ratio of the free fractions, so FP over FND, times by the uh, ratio of the partition coefficient, well, well, the partition coefficient between the free concentration in tissue and the free concentration in plasma. So the way to, to look at this, we, we've measured free fractions in using equilibrium dialysis for both plasma free fraction and tissue free fraction. So if we plot that ratio on the x-axis and we plot the PET VND derived from kinetic analysis on the y-axis, what we can see is that if CFT uh, over CFP equals one, i.e. if the free concentration is identical in plasma and tissue, then we will get something that lies along the line of identity. In, in practice, if we've got something like a small molecule entering the tissue via um, passive diffusion, then we would have exactly that. We would expect at equilibrium, the free concentration to be the same in both plasma and tissue. And we can see here that certainly the green dots demonstrate something that's close to the line of identity. It turns out 
these green dots are compounds that have been predicted by uh, artificial intelligence routines to be those that do not suffer from any uh, active transport liability. So active transport is probably the, the most common example of that is when you've kind of got a pump, uh, which can either pump things in or out of the brain, and it takes energy and it induces a concentration gradient. And so PGP substrate is the classic for that in terms of it's it's a pump that acts as a, an efflux pump to remove things from the brain. And so the compounds in red were predicted to be have some reasonable likelihood of being PGP substrates. So what's interesting is that a number, about half of these actually do fall significantly below this line of identity and are consistent with active transport, i.e. the, the concentration of the free concentration in tissue is significantly lower than that in plasma. And one, one point that adds to that story is, is the one that's joined by this dotted white line because this was the paramide, which is a known uh, PGP substrate, and it was inhibited in the second scan using cyclosporine. And when you do that, it comes back to being consistent with having a, a partition co free partition coefficient of one. So tools using kinetic analysis of data combine that with the uh, equilibrium dust, this assays, and you're able to start to assess free brain concentrations and whether you've got what type of transport you've got in, into the brain. Other ways that kinetic uh, data can be used in terms of biodistribution studies. This is this is a labeled drug. So this is a GSK drug. This is lapatinib. This is uh, orally administered uh, drug for breast cancer and, and other solid tumors. So small molecule. This was directly labeled with carbon eleven, and then IV administration to to subjects. Really, the question here was to to understand whether lapatinib could get into the brain in order to uh, deal with brain metastases. And what one was able to do through the kinetic analysis here was to partition uh, very carefully the signal of what was in blood versus what was in tissue. And you'll see that if we look at the images on the left at the top, this is the MR. You've got a tumor you can clearly see circled there. Um, what what uh, what was observed from this was by doing the kinetic analysis because what you're able to do is um, from a kinetic point of view you're able to uh, fit VB times your blood concentration that you've measured and um, add in the appropriate tissue component from from a, a compartmental model and stuff like that sort of thing. So what this was was able to say was that. Uh, for the brain metastases sort of thing, you were able to get signal in there, and this wasn't blood, this was the metastases, um, but that uh, this was likely entering that due to um, sort of blood-brain barrier breakdown rather than delivery into normal tissue. So um, it may be useful for treatment of metastases, but unlikely to be useful in terms of a prophylactic, i.e. it's it seems to be only getting into tumors there because of, of the breakdown of the barrier. Uh, moving on to sort of larger molecules, this is just to show that there's you know significant kinetic information for those if you're administering them intrathecally. So this is just an example of a technetium DTPA label experiment to demonstrate the uh, uh, the purpose of of that type of experiment. And what you can see following uh, intravenous injection in the sort of more lumbar CSF area here, that as you progress with time, you know, going up to sort of two to three hours, you start to see uh, significant uh, distribution in brain tissue. And I think this is the sort of thing that uh, with the great developments of the Explorer scanner and high sensitivity for, for those types of technology, that uh, some of the kinetic information that one will be able to determine from imaging data derived from, from the scanner that Simon and Ramsey have developed, I think we're all really excited about to see, you know, how we can use that in some of these uh, 
some of these experimental settings. So looking forward to seeing some of that data soon. So coming on to uh, target engagement, this is, um, I mean, I think for those, there's a point in drug development called proof of concept, which really comes at the point between phase 2A and phase 2B, which is this point where you're about to invest large amounts of money to look at this in big patient populations. At that point, you want to have confidence really of, of three things that uh, you're definitely going to need for a for, for successful CNS drug. One is that it gets into the brain. Two, that it engages with the target at a sufficient level. And three, that it has a pharmacodynamic effect. So we've just talked about how imaging can provide confidence on, you know, what's the tissue exposure? Does it get in into the tissue at suitable level? Now we can also use imaging to look at target engagement. The types of experiment we're looking at here, we need one of those imaging biomarkers that measures the concentration of the protein target that our drug is designed for. Uh, and when we have one of those, we can administer it in tracer level at baseline. Uh, and measure the available concentration of these receptors represented in, in blue here. And, and then subsequently, if we give a drug and then re-administer uh, the radio tracer, we can then, through a process of uh, looking at the fractional change in this available signal, we can work out what proportion of the target sites is occupied by that drug. And then we can do that at different uh, doses we can relate that to the plasma concentration and really start to build up a, a full characterization of, uh, of the PK to uh, target occupancy relationship. This can be done for a significant number of drug targets these days. We probably have, I'd say, the order of 50 or 60 um, successful selective uh, molecular imaging agents that allow you to image different brain targets that have been used in in drug development studies. So just a few examples here. Top rows represent baselines. Bottom rows represents post-dose. So you can see sort of changes in the selective um, specific target signals for, for these different agents where, where the targets are expressed in different areas of the brain. So glycine transporter, <clears throat> dopamine receptors, histamine receptors, TSPO, serotonin transporters, uh, mu opioid receptors as well. So these are experiments that uh, can be performed, high, high amount of value to perform these at first time in human studies uh, <clears throat> because that gives you early clinical information on whether you're going to achieve the levels of target engagement that that program may need. They also, I mean, this is the other thing to think about is, is, is actually provides you information on, on blood brain barrier penetration. So if you've got uh, a good molecular agent that allows you to image the target, then you don't need to do biodistribution studies. You can kill two birds with one stone in a much more effective way by doing occupancy studies. But these, the other thing these things lead to is dose selection for future studies. So if, you know, combined with other preclinical or clinical information about needing, say, 70 or 80 percent target occupancy typically for so for an antagonist drug, then you know you can actually very carefully select the doses you're going to use in, in subsequent phase two and phase three trials. This is uh, an example of an occupancy study. This is one did back when we were at GSK. This was looking at two different drugs uh, labeled here, drug A and drug B. Uh, this was with uh, PHNO, and the particular drug that was being developed here, the interest was around the, the level of D3 receptor occupancy. And so using PHNO, you can regionally selectively image D3 using a very small area called the substantia nigra because there's a much higher uh, presence of D3 there compared to D2. So this allows you to image effectively a pure D3 signal by just selecting uh, or focusing your analysis on that particular region. If you look at that in terms of these two drugs, what you'll notice is that we can plot, this is all done in human, we can plot the, the concentration in nanograms per mil 
against the level of drug occupancy you get. And we can also combine this with other information. So each of these drugs will have, you know, uh, a maximum tolerated dose, at which point you start to see safety issues should you go above that. So in this case, for, for both of these assets, this was due to uh, what's called a heart delta QT issue, which meant that the maximum concentration of drug A was 450, maximum concentration for drug B was 800. What you can then do is calculate the sort of therapeutic index or the predicted therapeutic index. So this is, i.e., to achieve the necessary target level of occupancy, 80% for both of these drugs here, how much, what's the window you, you have before you get to the maximum tolerated dose? So this tells you that you've got 4.5 for drug A and 1.3 for drug B. So in this case, drug A was taken forward because you have the ability to suitably achieve the necessary target occupancy uh, with, with a window for uh, different PK behavior in different humans and stuff like that, ensuring that this has the opportunity to be a successful uh, therapeutic. So the other thing to mention here is that uh, all of the, the data we've just looked at use fully dynamic data and kinetic models to derive binding potentials or volumes of distribution from which uh, occupancy estimates were, were obtained. But there's also different types of kinetics going on here, which is to do with occupancy itself. So if you think about the, the level of target engagement of that drug, that changes both with the dose. So if you give more drug, you will get a higher level of, of target engagement. Uh, but it also changes over time because the, the body is, is uh, handling that drug, eliminating it, metabolizing it, all those kind of things. So you've got kind of dose time, both of those things uh, coming into effect your levels of occupancy. And you can start to think about this. I think this is a really nice elegant experiment which shows uh, this is two different drugs binding to the mu opioid receptor and it shows different kind of kinetic uh, characteristics for how uh, a, a drug uh, behaves in relation for its plasma concentration and to its target occupancy. On the left we have a, a GSK compound uh, and what you see there is that independent of the time at which occupancy was measured. So blue represents early time points around three hours, red intermediate about four to 27 hours, green 32 to 51, independent of what time, it doesn't matter. These, these occupancy levels actually just relates in a simple way to the plasma concentration. And that is it fits on a classical Emax curve and simple. And what we would actually say in that case is that we actually have a direct relationship between the plasma concentration and occupancy. If we go to naltrexone, this compound is more complicated because what you start to see here is hysteresis or an indirect relationship between, uh, between occupancy and uh, the plasma concentration. So you can actually see that you get, depending on the time, you can have different values of occupancy. So the blue points are early, but you can see the green and red are late. And if you focus on the early part here, what you see is for the same plasma concentration early on, actually later on, you end up having a higher occupancy. And this leads to kinetic models that describe the relationship between uh, the plasma concentration and, uh, and target occupancy. So there's direct models that we talked about being described by uh, an Emax model, which you can argue really doesn't have uh, any significant kinetics. It's more of a static model. And then, but if you get to indirect relationships, you need kinetic models, which describe the occupancies here. So this is saying the rate of change of the occupancy is equal to K on times the plasma concentration times the difference between the, the total receptors, occupancy minus the uh, occupancy minus the K off times the receptor occupancy. So in this particular case, you need to know if the, the uh, on rate for the drug and the off rate for the drug start to come into to what's going on and its behavior. We've also looked at this in the context of being able to predict what happens when you start to 
repeat dose drugs. So everything we just looked at has talked about what would be a single dose of drug to characterize uh, what follows. And if you look at the top row here, we have got that same kind of data. So we've got a single dose experiment. We're saying that if you inject different uh, doses and follow those over time, you will get different concentration uh, time curves in your plasma of that drug. Now on the right hand side, if we follow for the equivalent uh, experiments, what's going on in terms of target occupancy, you will get different curves and you can measure those. So in order to predict what's happening at repeat dose, we can do this without necessarily having to do the repeat dose experiment, but from single dose data. And this comes from having kinetic models that we just talked about that characterize that PKRO relationship and then applying that to the appropriate repeat dose PK we can then project to see what the repeat dose uh, target occupancy would give us. And we did an experiment to, to look at this in a little bit more detail to see what was, was going on. So we did, we used uh, DASP, which is a serotonin transporter imaging agent with high signal in, in midbrain thalamus and the likes. We took 10 healthy subjects. We gave them four scans. So initially we did a baseline scan we then uh, gave them 20 milligrams of geloxygen. We then did two uh, post single dose time point measures for imaging. So these were somewhere in the range of 0 to 72 hours. And then we put these individuals on repeat dosing for, for four days before giving them a final PET scan. So from this, we were able to, to characterize what was going on post single dose. And we were also able to have a, a measure of the, the target occupancy at repeat dose. The analysis of all of that uh, ensured the the, uh, the two kind of uh, most well the most relevant graphs to look at here are if you look at um, uh, the second one in which is if you assume a direct relationship for geloxetine. So this assumes that just an Emax relationship to uh, describing the relationship between the PK and the target occupancy. And on the right hand side, if you look at uh, the, the final, the graph there, this is the model output from uh, actually applying an indirect model. And part of the reason for us doing this was to, there was some evidence geloxetine did have an indirect relationship between PK and its target engagement. What we were able to show here was that actually there was a statistically significant improvement in the prediction of repeat dose data by applying uh, the indirect model. So gives one a way to sort of predict repeat dose data from, uh, uh, from single dose data. Okay. Um, so that's looked at target engagement. So coming on to final section of talking about late phase stuff. So we're talking about phase two, phase threes. These are uh, large multi-center trials. Often, many of them that we're looking at in micro are in diseases like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. I'm gonna focus on some kinetic analysis that relates to, to Alzheimer's today. So just very broadly, I'm sure, Many of you um, will be familiar with this disease, if not through one's own families and, uh, and relatives, but um, just the significant presence of this worldwide is, is huge. It's, it's, a, it's an incredible socioeconomic problem that is facing us all. So in, I think it was, what is it, 2020, 40 million, and that's gonna go up and double by about, to about 80 in 2040. So neurodegenerative disease, um, sort of life expectancy three to seven years from diagnosis. Key pathology for this is the buildup of two misfolded proteins in the brain. So one is beta amyloid, the other is uh, hyperphosphorylated tau. And these, these misfolded proteins become tangled and form plaques and the like and start to kill off uh, healthy neurons, which leads to the, the disease cascade. So 
primary biomarkers for this that are, that are used or out there are amyloid and tau on the molecular imaging side, and then MRI is also looked at to, to measure atrophy in the brain. I think we're an exciting time for this in the sense that uh, really for actually since the discovery of, of Alzheimer's in 1906, since then, up until last year, we've we've only had symptomatic treatments. And so this has been, you know, we're on the cusp of seeing disease modifying therapies for Alzheimer's, which is incredibly exciting. Uh, Aducadumab from Biogen last year was, was approved. I think there's some controversial data there uh, with two trials, one that means positive, one that doesn't, which is uh, a little difficult. But uh, I think ASI uh, just presented some really exciting top line results that will be presented at CTAD uh, next week, showing a positive readout in their phase three. Roche, Gantineuramab, unfortunately read negative last week. But then there's also a lot of interest in uh, in Lily's Don Enema. So really exciting time. These are the sorts of trials that uh, are being run to evaluate these types of agents. So in phase two, this would typically be about 200 patients. Phase three, 2,000 patients. So this is an example of a phase three we're running with all the imaging sites that are acquiring data in, in those trials. In actual fact, for, for these types of trials to simplify them, to minimize the, the time that subjects from the scanner, one is using static imaging, so typically 20 million acquisitions for, for subjects, and they will have, uh, they will be assigned to either a drug or a placebo arm, they will have a screening scan and then follow-up scans uh, throughout the trial. But going to talk a little bit about here about how kinetic analysis has been involved in, in actually development of uh, analytical methods to uh, analyze such data. So another slightly different way that uh, kinetic analysis comes in, but we'll come back to that in a second. So just, but just to emphasize that, you know, the two ways that uh, this type of imaging is used, so stratification, we want to enroll people in these trials that are going to have the right disease profile. That means, means that evaluating uh, any pharmacodynamic changes following uh, therapy is going to be maximizing one's chance for a positive readout. So often way subjects are enrolled into amyloid, uh, sorry, into Alzheimer's trials is to ensure that they have a <clears throat> visible or quantifiable level of amyloid in the brain consistent with uh, Alzheimer's disease. And longitudinal analysis is then looking at the changes in these in these measures of uh, amyloid or, or tau over time in both active and placebo arms. And if your drug is successful, what you would like to, to show is that uh, with your drug, you start to reduce that accumulation process of this toxic protein. Uh, today, really for stratification, visual reads have often been the uh, the go-to methods for stratification and SUBR approaches. So just taking a ratio of a target to reference region have been the go-to methods for, uh, for longitudinal analysis. We, I think the thing to say is we have a very good agents for measuring amyloids. So following the initial uh, 11, <clears throat> carbon 11 PIB work from Chet, uh, Chet Mathis, Bill Clunk, Pittsburgh developed successful FDA approved agents for now we have Flobeta, Peter Flobeta, Ben, Fludimetamol, all approved. In the same way, we are now developing many successful tau imaging agents, which are becoming ever more uh, high quality with <clears throat> good signal to noise and less background. Uh, issues. So import, we have a range of important biomarkers that are available in this space. And this is the sort of classical, you, you may have heard, called jack curves for describing what goes on in relation to biomarkers in the disease trajectory in, in Alzheimer's. So one of the reasons amyloid is so important is that it's one of the earliest signatures of the disease. And you can see that here. It comes before tau, it comes before structural changes, cognitive and clinical assessment. So it's an important biomarker. And that's why we've been developing uh, more advanced analytics really to enhance the information you can get from, 
from amyloid imaging. Uh, and this has led to uh, what we call the IQ platform. This is uh, being derived from what we call disease-driven analysis algorithms. And it's really this spatial temporal biomathematical analysis that is a different type of kinetic analysis, but has led to the development of this particular algorithm. So I'll talk a little bit about that and some of the data derived from that uh, in conclusion. So we take in significant data to start with. We do this kinetic analysis really to derive what are the salient uh, canonical representations of the changes in signal as somebody uh, converts from healthy to full, uh, full on AD. We're currently using this in, in clinical trials, both for stratification and pharma readouts, but with the advent of uh, the possibility of uh, approved and reimbursed therapies, we also see these tools having value in the, in the diagnostic arena too. So this, this is where amyloid IQ started from. This was taking around 700 uh, subjects. Uh, this is from ADNI. This is with Florbenapir. And we were able to line up these 700 subjects in a in, as a chronological data set. And we were able to do this because we combined this information with some information we obtained from Cliff Jack from longitudinal amyloid studies. And this had a curve which showed that how uh, the sort of global cortical level of amyloid changed in subjects over time. And this population curve uh, enabled us to line up all these subjects and give them a single time in terms of what we call amyloid time, which is from not zero to 30. Zero being completely healthy, 30 being you know full on dementia. And it's of that level of time in which amyloid is kind of continuing to build up in your brain. So Many of us probably are already somewhere along these curves, unfortunately, but that's another story. Um, what we were then able to, to show is we looked at the regional analysis of these data, and we wanted to find a mathematical model to describe their accumulation. We hypothesized this could be described by uh, a logistic growth model. Uh, this has previously been shown to be how amyloid accumulates in test tubes and a range of other things, and also kind of visually fitted the type of curves we were seeing as we, as we looked at uh, different regional data. This is a, an equation that has four parameters in it, effectively. We have the, uh, well, the original, just the original logistic growth equation itself has these two parameters. Okay, so we've got the rate of change of amyloid is equal to R amyloid times one minus amyloid over K. It turns out that R is the initial exponential growth rate and K is carrying capacity as we would describe it. We can solve this equation. We can put it in the context of imaging data. And, and when you do that, you end up with this equation here, which has four parameters. This is your, if we're to look at it in represent to a SUVR image over time, we've got some background because we're dealing with an imaging agent that even in the absence of amyloid has some signal. It binds to white matter, for instance, which is nothing to do with the target. So there's a non-specific background. Um, you should consider it's, it's represented at time t equals zero there. And then we have the carrying capacity. This is the maximum level of amyloid you can get. So when you're fully demented, you end up saturating at a value of K. We have a value of T50. This is the half time, the time at which you reach half that maximum value of amyloid. And R is this initial uh, un well, unconstrained exponential growth rate, the initial rate at which you start accumulating data. So we fitted that to, I think it's 100 odd parcellated regions. What we found by comparing different models is, well, this just shows how we parcellated things out. Actually, this goes into the detail of showing you the sort of mean cortical curve from Jack that we were able to, to line everybody up by and give them a time and so on. So coming back here, we've just talked about that one. We then looked at, in this context, these four parameters. We, sorry. Sorry, Roger. Uh, you yeah. have about five minutes. Perfect. Thanks, Gilbert. Um, so we looked at 
different uh, models. There's 16 different ones, assuming that uh, these parameters either vary by region or they're constant across the brain. And these are the different models. So this just assumes model one that things don't change across regions to, to things that, uh, that do down the bottom here. So the one the model, if we looked at uh, using Bayesian identification criteria, we identified that the, the most optimal model that described what was going on was when uh, the exponential growth rate was constant, the half time to maximal amyloid was constant. The only two things that change by region are this carrying capacity and the non-specific binding. And you can see that's the model fit you get to all of those. I think it's 90 regions by making that assumption. So the only thing that's changing there is the non-specific and the carrying capacity. So you can then uh, fix those two values to the regional analysis and estimate an individual voxel by voxel value for your non-specific and your carrying capacity. And when you do that, you get these two canonical images here, uh, the lower one being your background non-specific, shown in for reference is an MR, which has been segmented by white matter and gray matter. You can see that the uh, non-specific is very similar to white matter as we would expect. And then the carrying capacity whilst related to gray matter is not the same. This then, with these two images, what you can do is just generate an algorithm to say that I can describe any, um, based on where we come from, we can say we can describe any of those uh, uh, amyloid data sets just as a linear combination of these two uh, images. And so we get two parameters. So we can nonlinear spatially transform any image into stereotactic space. We can do an image-based regression on these two canonical representations. We get two parameters, non-specific and amyloid load. Amyloid load, the way it's calibrated, zero represents the average healthy subject and 100% represents the uh, average AD subject. You can see on the left here, we have an example of a healthy subject, which has an amyloid load of 15%, and of a demented subject, which has an amyloid load of uh, 67%. There's a couple more images, just adding in a MCI subject in the middle. You can see, even as we can traverse sort of from healthy to MCI, this is just fitting two, two parameters, two numbers, is able to fit what is the, the data itself on the top row, and the fit on the bottom, and you can see how remarkably good they are with the residuals on the bottom showing uh, very little signal. We've shown that this outperforms traditional SUVR analyses in cross-sectional analysis, so you get about a 50% increase in effect size with amyloid AQ. We've also shown that this uh, increases power in longitudinal studies, so about a 40% increase in effect size with that. So that's been really exciting. Just close with a couple of slides showing uh, more recent data. This is comparing amyloid IQ with uh, both histopathologies data, which is treated as the gold standard in terms of uh, when approving an imaging agent and a read or quantification method. This is showing that for versus pathology, we have, uh, so this is end of life studies where people have brains taken out, uh, uh, you know, they've been imaged just prior to that and you compare whether these are be determined as having amyloid present or not, we get a 94% accuracy as compared with pathology data. We get the same uh, when you compare with a majority read. So each of these scans were read by five readers. The majority decision was taken as to whether they had amyloid or not. Again, we come up with a 94% uh, agreement. Going through here, this is quite interesting too, because this is the majority read. So you've got five readers, but actually, if you go to say, let's only include, you know, actually where humans agree on what the situation is. So these five individuals all have to agree. If you do that, we have very near close uh, exact agreement uh, with humans. So we have a complete agreement in terms of specificity and 97% uh, you know, in terms of sensitivity. So we really think that we have an algorithm that uh, represents uh, visual reads and can be deployed uh, clinically. So that was NeuroSeq, those two slides. This is just data from Amivid or Flobetapir, 
which shows very, very similar results, just not quite as clean. And that's what's been observed with that tracer as compared to Neurosync previously. So I think with that, just to, to summarize that uh, both imaging and kinetic analysis have different applications of kinetics, not just applying one or two tissue compartment models, but thinking how data changes, uh, whether that be with time or space and the likes actually impact in terms of decision making in drug development. So just acknowledge uh, Chi and Alex for their work on the uh, biomarker uh, development and amyloid IQ sections. Thank you very much.